is we're, we're looking at the obligations of the church in response to God's offer of spiritual blessings to all who come to Jesus. That's a summary, if you wish, in one sentence of what has taken place in the first four chapters of Ephesians. God has given blessings to the church, Paul has explained that, and the church responds to those blessings in a variety of ways. Um, by providing or by enforcing or pursuing, I think is a better word, uh, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, that's one response. By living in a righteous way, that's another response. And um, this idea of righteousness, the response of righteousness to God's offer of blessings, uh, we've broken that down, or Paul rather, has broken that down into a variety of elements. So we're looking at the various features of the righteous lifestyle that Paul describes from chapter 417 all the way over to chapter 619. Those, that material there is all about one thing. So far he's described three features of that righteous life that we offer to God in response for the blessings. Number one, a loving attitude. Number two, a life lived beyond reproach. Number three, the idea of piety. That's what we talked about last week. Uh, and we broke the idea of piety down uh, as prudence, spirit-filled living, submissiveness among brothers and sisters. So today we're going to look at the fourth element of a righteous lifestyle described by Paul, and that is an ordered life. An ordered life. Now the three previous features had to do with a person's individual character and attitude towards God. The last feature describes the Christian's relationship with family and society. So the first three features of a righteous life have to do with the, you know, the vertical relationship between man and God. The last one has to do with the horizontal feature between man and other people, a person and his family, a person and the society he lives in. So when it comes to these, God has established and desires, in a word, order, regardless of who we are, order. Unfortunately, sometimes we see the relationship we have in family or the relationship we have in society, we see the goal as perfection, but that's not the goal that God sets. God sets the goal of order. So he begins by talking about orderly families in chapter five. And um, he begins with the family because it is the basic unit in society. If there is disorder here, well then there's disorder in society as well. So we pick up his, uh, his uh, writings in chapter five in verse uh, 22. He says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now you have to understand, Paul doesn't cover every single detail of a woman's role within marriage. Instead, he establishes the one attitude that will guide all the other attitudes. He says, wives should submit to their husbands. I think I mentioned this in a, another lesson or a sermon recently, this idea of submission, a military term, means to place oneself under or to yield, to obey. Paul is saying that wives are to do this voluntarily because it's not a question of superiority, it's a question of faith. That a wife submit to her husband isn't because the husband is superior in any way, it's just a question of obedience because we believe. Paul says that in the same way that you submit to Christ, submit also to your husband. And the implied idea is you can't do one without doing the other. You can't say I'm in submission to Christ but I'm in rebellion or you know, I'm independent of my husband, he doesn't tell me what to do, I'm the boss, blah, blah. He says those two things don't work together. Paul also answers the question, why? Why should this be so? And he answers it because God has given the leadership role in the family to the husband, just as he has made Christ 
the head of the church. There can only be one head, just as there can only be one body. And so God has created marriage in such a way that it is a miniature copy, a microcosmic copy, if you wish, of the relationship between Christ and the church. It's almost a parable that he's uh, putting forth here. You know parables, we're going to talk about that in the lesson in the sermon today. Things that are laid alongside of each other. In the physical world there's marriage, he says, and marriage is a parable, a living parable of what's going on in the spirit world, the relationship between Christ and His church. That a wife willingly submits to her husband is a spiritual idea that is not grasped by the carnal mind or the world in general. You know, I'm speaking to a friendly crowd here, but if I went to a, a campus, if I went to University of Oklahoma and I was a speaker there, I don't think they would buy into what I'm talking about right here, because it's, it's, it's not a worldly idea. The point that Paul makes is that when this takes place, when the wife is voluntarily in submission to her husband, it creates harmony between what is seen and, by, and, and with what is not seen in the spiritual world. Now, you know, he mentions the ideal, he mentions what it is that we're aiming for. But we know that this is not always possible. Perhaps the husband is dead. Perhaps the husband is an unbeliever or abusive. Perhaps the husband refuses leadership. Perhaps the wife is evil. Perhaps she refused. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why this might not happen. Just as other things that he's mentioned, like a loving attitude or piety, submissiveness is a goal that one strives for through practice and prayer. But it should be a goal for all Christian wives. It doesn't happen automatically on the wedding day. All of a sudden you, 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 know, you give the vows and you walk down the aisle and all of a sudden, oh, you know, I'm in submission. It doesn't work like that. A woman learns this spiritual quality by living it. Now some say that this was a social thing in the first century, not valid for today. You know, the idea that it was a cultural idea, it's the same argument that people use to justify homosexuality. Well, that was a thing in those days, you know, but today we're so much more enlightened. You know. But you need to remember what the Bible, you know, how the Bible puts this idea of submissiveness. He says, the church has this exact same relationship with Christ and it has this relationship with Him forever. It's not based in culture. And so in the same way, so long as there is a marriage relationship, and marriage will exist until we're in heaven, then this is the way that God intends for it to remain. You see, marriage will always be a reflection of the church, always. Just as the church does not change, the relationship between Christ and His church doesn't change, the inference is then the relationship between the wife and the husband, it doesn't change either until that basic relationship is done away with in heaven. And then of course he says there's no confusion, the wife should be prepared to yield completely to her husband. This is what many times young women should consider before marrying. You know, if you're a minister, you've done a lot of weddings, and I have done a lot of weddings. But I rarely hear the young women that I'm counseling or talking with about their wedding, I rarely hear them say, is this the kind of man I would be willing to submit to? We should have a questionnaire you know, that says, is this you know, your future husband, your fiance, is this, are you willing to submit to this man? Not just when you know, not just you know, where are we going to live and who's going to work and what kind of wedding dress am I going to have? Those things have some importance, of course. But am I willing to put my life into his hands? And I would say to young women, if you're not willing to do that, then don't get married. Don't do it. This is a major cause of marital conflict and divorce, the confusion of roles within marriage. 
You know, the idea is, well, I'll submit only when and where I feel like it. And today, of course, in our society, the media and just the, the, the general groupthink of our, of our society promotes the idea of independence. You should be independent. You shouldn't even lose this idea when you go into marriage. There is no independence in marriage. We're not codependent, that's, that's, that has a negative, you know, that has negative undertones. We're not codependent, but we are dependent on each other. Isn't that why we get married? Some people are afraid of abuse, of being abused, and with reason. Abuse comes from sinful men who do not understand what their actual role in a Christian marriage is. That's why you know, I encourage young women, marry someone who is a Christian. You, you, you have a starting point. Now in verses 25 to, 20, uh, to 33, he talks to husbands. And what's interesting about this passage is that Paul spends more time talking to husbands than he does to wives. So let's uh, pick up the reading in verse 25a, shall we? He says, husbands, love your wives. Again, Paul mentions only one thing about them, but it describes the attitude towards their wives that will set the tone for the entire relationship. Three words, four words. Husbands, love your wives. He could have said a whole bunch of other things, just that one admonition. Now, in the Bible, um, the word love, the English word love, uh, or the Greek words that are translated into love are many. You know, in English we say, I love my wife, I love apple pie, I love hunting, I love my dog. You know, I mean, we use the same word for everything. In the Greek, they were a little more particular about how they used the word love. The word eros, for example, was the word the Greeks used to describe physical love or sensual love or you know, the kind of love, oh, I love that movie or I love the fourth, fifth symphony or I love this and that. That's the word eros, sensuous type love. It's not evil, it's just based in physicality. Another word they use is philios which was the word for friendship. Uh, another word that comes from this word is philanth uh, philanthropy, you know, the giving to causes and so on and so forth. Another word they used for love was storjos, which was the kind of love we have in a family. You know, I love my grandma. Well, I love my grandma and I really have love for my grandma, but it's not the same kind of love that I have for my girlfriend. You see what I'm saying? It's not the same thing. Well, all these things, these kind of love, eros, philios, storjos, these three exist in most marriages and they describe how the marriage evolves. But the word that Paul uses here when he says, husbands love your wives, is not eros, not philios, not storjos. He uses the word agapeo, which is a word that describes a love that is neither physical or friendship or family. It's a sacrificial love a love that is sacrificial in nature, and the next verses he gives Jesus as the example of this sacrificial love. In other words, he uses Jesus to describe the quality of this love. So let's keep reading now in verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So he's saying Jesus' love, in other words, the love that you husbands have for your wife should be the type that Jesus had for the church. And Jesus' love for his bride, the church, included, first of all, sacrifice. His death in order to save the church. The love that he had for the church always uh, included the element of wanting what is best for the church. In other words, the teachings that Jesus gives to the church guarantees her life. And service, 
his care to completely purify her and give her an honorable position next to him. So every husband has a degree of sensuality and friendliness and sense of belonging in a family. But for his attitude to be raised to the spiritual level, there needs to exist a readiness to love his wife in a sacrificial way. This is what Christ demands of the husband in a marriage. Pretty high target, isn't it? He only says one thing to the wife, but he, he really lays it on to the husband. Yeah, the leadership has been given to you, but along with leadership comes what? Responsibility, high responsibility. Well, in verse 28, 9, and 30, he explains why. So let's read on, verse 28. He says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Why? Why do this? Why should the husband react in this way? Because in the marriage, two become one, and when a man loves his wife, he is loving himself. Again, Christ is the example as the head. He loves. He cares for the body in all patience, in all tenderness, in all necessary sacrifice. That's why the church happily submits to Jesus. So this is what young men should look for and consider before they marry. I go back to my you know, marriage counseling example. Young men ask, should ask themselves the question, is the girl that I want to marry ready to submit to me in marriage? That should be a kind of a conversation that the couple has together. What does this mean? What would this mean in our relationship? Is, she, is he prepared to provide leadership? You know, what a wonderful day when our young women in relationships with young men ask the question to their future husband, are you ready to take leadership of my life, our home and our family? I mean, really, are you really ready to take the leadership on? And the key question, is he ready to sacrifice himself for her? In other words, provide for her and provide for the family and place her needs above his own needs. Oh my. There's the $64 question. Is he able to treat her as a special gift from God and give her honor and respect? There, there are the key questions. Those are the hard questions. Never mind, uh, you know, are we going to live in your house, my house? Are we going to sell your car or my car? Are we going to keep two dogs or give one away and keep your dog or my dog? You know what I mean? These are the hard questions that the man needs to answer. Is he ready to answer those questions or does he only want her because she will satisfy his needs? And pri primarily his sexual needs. And he only wants her because she's going to take care of his house. In other words, spoil him. Maybe replace his mother. Oh, beware. <laughs> You see, if men knew how to be the head of their wives as Christ is the head of the church, women would happily submit themselves to their leadership. The problem is, the big problem in our society, we have such a self-centered generation. And, and, and parents, you and I parents, you know, we're partly responsible for that. That young men are not willing can't even conceive of the idea that their role in marriage is a sacrificial one. And young women many times just don't get the idea that they're giving up independence to put themselves in submission to a man who will lead their home morally and spiritually. Notice here, Paul doesn't talk about work. There's no mention about women working or not working. That has, that's neither here nor there. It's all about attitude, all about 
conditions of the heart. So Paul summarizes God's plan for orderliness in marriage in verse 31 to 33. He says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. So the original plan, he mentions, the original plan for marriage cut ties with parents. Spouse's priority, number one. More trouble in marriage happens because the, the couple, one or the other, refuses to cut you know, ties with the parents. And I don't mean stop talking to them, but they, they still think, you know, she still thinks that daddy is the one that has the best advice and before I ask my husband, I'm going to ask my dad or I'm going to confirm everything my husband says with my dad. You see, that's, that's not a good thing. One man, one woman, Paul says. One unit, together for life, no conditions. There's no condition in that once married for life, whether he you know, stays healthy, she stays beautiful, whatever. Then he says, this model for marriage is heavenly in nature because it reflects the union that Christ has with his church. That answers the question, why? Why this model? It, it goes against the model in modern society. Why should we maintain it? Because it is based on the eternal model that exists in heaven. And then he says, within that relationship, the basic attitudes are the wife submits to her husband in all things. The husband loves his wife with a sacrificial love as he loves himself. High ideals, I, 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 don't, I don't doubt it. Pretty high ideal, but at least if we know what we're shooting for, if we know where we're going, we have a chance to get there. All right, so we go to chapter six now. He's spoken to wives, he's spoken to husbands, and now he's going to address the third part of the family unit, and that is the children. Order in a family requires that mothers and fathers maintain certain attitudes and roles, as well as the kids. Again, Paul doesn't give all the details of the children's role and obligation, just the basic one found in the Old Testament from which the other two ideas come from. So let's read chapter six, one to three. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So this is simply a variation of the commandment in Exodus 20, 12. Children are to obey their parents. Why? Because of the Lord, and according to the Lord. The Lord demands it, that's why, and the obedience is limited to things that the Lord would demand. The Lord doesn't demand that you obey your children to go out and steal, you know, just the idea. So the basis for this, as I say, is the original command in Exodus. In Exodus, the promise is that those who do would have a long life in the promised land. Paul revises the promise for all people living everywhere, so to include the Gentiles. Verse four brings up a very interesting point, says, and fathers, again, doesn't mention mothers specifically. Fathers, however, he says, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So he adds an exhortation to fathers here in bringing up the children. The command for children is to obey. But that command is tempered with an appeal to fathers not to use their authority in such a way to provoke their children to become angry. Well, how would that happen? Well, being unfair or unreasonably harsh or mean. You know, it's, I think we all understand that children have feelings and to provoke them to helpless anger is wrong. And when I'm saying helpless anger, I've seen parents provoke their children by making crazy demands on them. And then when children are angry, punish them for their anger. That's what I call helpless anger. And you know what helpless anger turns into? It turns into rage. And if children are enraged, but have to swallow that down for fear of punishment, what do you think happens then when they start growing up? Who do you think they take it out on? Husband, wife, 
Instead, Paul says that fathers should raise their children according to the discipline and the teachings of Christ. Now in those days, the father had power of life and death over the children who had absolutely no rights. Today, we've kind of gone the other way. You know, children say, hey, hey don't, don't talk too loud. You know, I'm going to call DHS on you. When in those days, parents had all the rights. So Paul urges fathers to actually direct the upbringing of their children in accordance to the practice and teaching of Jesus and not according to the practice of the times or personal whims. And I want you to note that he, he gives this command to the fathers. You notice what's happened in a lot of relationships? I hear men saying, well, she takes care of the kids and I take care of the job. I'm in charge of bringing home the money, she's in charge of the kids. Don't tell me about the kids, you do what you want. That's not what Paul says here. Paul says the fathers have the final responsibility for children. If they're the leaders of their family, they have the final responsibility. They may not have the time if they're working, obviously, if the mom is at home and you know, mothers tend to spend more time with the children, but they have a responsibility, an important one. So the same holds true today where the cardinal sin of fathers is not harshness or cruelty, but rather neglect. Poor example, poor direction, lack of direction. So Paul concludes his instructions for an orderly family by, ref uh, by referencing the duty of children to obey uh, their parents and fathers to lead in the raising of children, which is opposite of what actually happens in our society. And we are fast becoming a matriarchal society. Mom, so many single, more, more children are born to single mothers than to couples in our society. Read an article the other day that said that one of the big crises in education, there are no men. There are no men teaching, and hardly any men teaching at the primary school level. When I was a school teacher many, many years, well, 30 years ago, at least half the staff, I taught elementary and elementary school, form teacher for fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Half the, half the teachers were men. Today, wow, 90% of the teachers elementary level are women. I mean, it's not that they're bad teachers, but I'm just saying the, the balance of what children see, the types, the images of a man, what a man is, they don't, they don't get, to, daddy's never home, or daddy is not at home because mom's a single mom, then, then, then they go to school and it's a, a woman in daycare that takes care of them, a woman in, in kindergarten that takes care of them, it's a, it's a woman teacher from you know, first grade to sixth grade. And so we move on, you know, a, a well-ordered family, Paul then moves to a well-ordered society. So the fourth requirement of righteousness is ordered living, and Paul breaks these down into two main components. Ordered living is an ordered family and an ordered society. And so a righteous man or woman will strive to pattern his or family life according to the order that Christ provides in His word. That same person will also strive to pattern his position in society according to the will of Christ as well. So in these few verses, Paul will explain the responsibility of the two main positions within society of that era, slaves and masters. And his point is that regardless of the position in society, master or slave, a righteous person conducts himself in the order that Christ has given. And he starts with the slaves, Read in verse five, he says, slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With, uh, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Notice most of the instructions for the slave. Why? Because they have the harder role. So Paul doesn't give all the details concerning the responsibility if you're in the position of slave. You know, there were various classes of slaves in those days, each with a degree of responsibility and position. A bond slave was at the bottom, a steward was at the top. 
The key ingredient that Paul urges them is sincere obedience, sincere service. What does this require? Well, he says, obey with the knowledge that their masters are masters only of their bodies, not of their souls. Obey with respect and the knowledge that they do have authority over you. It might not be fair, but it's real, it's what is. Obey with the same enthusiasm that you would Christ and for His sake, not as hypocrites saying, yes, sir, but despising them in your heart. And he says, obey with good will, being positive and sincere, knowing that in doing uh, your service in this way, you really are doing the will of God and God will reward you in the end. Of course, these attitudes so easily transferred over into modern times, right? Employee, you know, who's, who's, who's ever worked for a boss that was hard to work for? Who's ever worked for a boss who was incompetent? Right? You're doing their job. They get the money and they get the this and they get the promotion, but you're actually doing the guts of their job. Who hasn't had that experience? I have and I see people going, oh yeah, sure. Do these instructions change because we put it in a modern setting and we change the titles from master to supervisor and slave to you know, first line mechanic or whatever you do? Paul doesn't promote or defend slavery, notice that? He simply gives those in that position the way to live so as to please the Lord and in doing so will demonstrate their righteousness even as slaves. In the end, the rise of Christianity did away with the slave system, not rebellion. And then he goes to masters, don't have a lot of time left. He goes to masters, verse nine, one verse. And he says, and masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So Paul finishes with a word to masters. I mean, there were Christians in those days who owned slaves. You know, Philemon owned slaves. This was the structure of that society. A household in those days included family and slaves, all part of one unit. To the masters, Paul gives one reminder, and that is that everyone, slave and master, has the same master in heaven who will judge a judge who will not be favorable to one or the other and will be judged according to the same standard. And what standard will that be? Righteousness. You were a slave all your life, were you righteous? You were a master all your life, were you righteous? To God's word. If this is so, then they should stop using coercion or threats and what follows to motivate their slaves. Again, an attitude of fairness and respect carried over to today's employer. The unsaid idea is that they should use what the master uses to motivate us. What does the Lord use to motivate us? Well, He uses kindness and teaching and encouragement and generosity, not just authority. I mean, if anyone in the whole world could just tell, order us to do what we need to do, God can. He has the final authority. But he doesn't. Yes, he tells us what we need to do, but he's constantly encouraging us and motivating us and blessing us. So that completes the information concerning the final element required to live in righteousness before God. An ordered life, order in one's family, order in society. Again, you have to remember, Paul doesn't give all the information about a subject in a single book. We could talk a long time about the idea of righteousness, but he gives several, you know, several points, several ways that righteousness uh, is um, seen, if you wish, uh, that is pertinent to the people who lived in Ephesus, considering the issues that they were going through at the time. There was disorder. He wants to restore order. All right, next week we're going to conclude with the final obligation of the church in response to God's blessings, uh, the last section of Ephesians, and that is faithfulness, faithfulness. And we'll go through that great passage, the armor of God.